Vamos a hacer esto muy informal. Es nada más una manera de cerrar el workshop. Eh, esperamos que haya sido productivo para todos y que hayan sacado bastante provecho y que les, les sirva, que sean cosas que de verdad pueden usar en sus clases ya lunes, ¿no? Eh, Estoy en otro mundo, en agosto o en septiembre, los que empiezan en septiembre. Ok, bueno, pero tienen todo el verano para pensarlo y usarlo. Eh, entonces, va, voy a dejarlos a ustedes hacer preguntas. Eh, yo sé que tú tenías una que me habías mandado, pero el que quiera hacer una pregunta me dicen y les llevo el micrófono y cualquier persona puede responder ¿no? y podemos comentar. Un anuncio rapidito. Um, hay un grupo en Facebook que se llama Teachers of Spanish Heritage Speakers. I don't know if you all are a part of it yet. Tienen un montón de ideas ahí. Like you were asking about readings. Lots of posts have been made about books, people's favorites, what their students have liked. So it's Teachers of Spanish Heritage Speakers. So everybody join. Um, I know that one of the big issues in heritage language teaching today is, is the fact that some schools don't offer a heritage program and they have to mix all the students together, right? But um, I think most of us here have the privilege of having separate heritage classes, okay? Uh, yet still we find ourselves with a lot of students who are mostly receptive bilinguals and they, and in my case at least, I don't admit them into my heritage class because I know that they'll struggle. Okay. And so I, I point them to the Spanish one and Spanish two classes and we enroll them there. And so what, what, I'm, what I'm wondering is for those students who are more receptive bilinguals and, and who don't have a lot of productive ability, um, what, what are some of the best teaching practices that you all have encountered in your research that are ideal for supporting the development of the language production and their proficiency when, when they're in that Spanish one or Spanish two class. Like what should that Spanish one or Spanish two teacher be doing, you know, with differentiated instruction with those heritage students that could really help them produce anything in particular or any answers? Any? So. And I have a colleague who's gonna be researching this, so. Like I was saying yesterday, um, one of the things that you can do, and then and that's what we do, because I mean, the language program that I direct, this is exactly the problem that we have. We have a lot of uh, heritage language learners in our L2 classes. So what we try to do is, um, we do a lot of group projects, like I said, group projects, yeah. And so what, I, what we do is, um, we put together L2 and heritage language learners. And so, um, Usually what happens is that each group has something to contribute to the other group. So heritage language learners, I mean, a lot of times, yes, they are receptive, but they have much more vocabulary than the, the L2s. So um, the whole idea is that, you know, they work together on a particular project. And like I said yesterday, we are doing a lot of identity texts. And so um, they work together on identity texts, and then they read each other's um, texts, and then um, they provide uh, feedback. And what, what we have is very specific questions. So the whole idea is to integrate the two groups. And then I've done that also with my translation classes too, when sometimes, um, so it's very common to have in, in upper division classes, L2 students and heritage language learners. And so what I do is, um, well, we, what we did, and one, one of the projects that I had throughout the semester was a translation of um, The Cat in the Hat, El Gato con Sombrero. There used to be, and now there's a good translation out there, but there used to be one that was really bad. So what I did is like, I divided the book into different um, groups, and then I put uh, heritage language learners and L2 learners together. And it was wonderful because the L2 learners could help with the literacy issues that they, you know, and then the heritage language learners uh, contribute with and anything that had to do with vocabulary. They had some and some expressions, the rhyming and everything because they their language was richer in terms of, you know, uh, vocabulary, but sometimes they didn't know how to write a particular word and then the L2 students 
came to, you know, uh, uh, in their assistance. And so that's one of the things that you can do. Um, just, you know, get as much group work as possible, but be very specific about what they need to do. Of course, objectives, guidelines, a lot of scaffolding, showing them how to work together. That's the, my suggestion, you know. One thing to consider is that even receptive students will be at the intermediate level for Hackful, uh, particularly not for reading and writing, but yes, for understanding. So if you have to place them somewhere, it cannot be the first level of Spanish that you have, it has to be higher. And I know that it's very difficult, but uh, all the research I've seen is that what we call receptive or passive heritage learners, they not enough to be why above the, the beginner's level? Uh, and then you can do what, I mean, um, Gabriela is saying, that is, is great, and also have separate readings for each group. So some readings that maybe relate most to your heritage learners, and maybe a more general text according to your, your textbook for the second language learners. I know what else. And if, if, you have, if you have a significant number of kids that you're doing that with, because the administration is going to be, we're not adding staff and we're not adding, like I get, so the argument is a lower level native speaker class where you don't add staff, you don't add sections. If you have 15 to 30, that's a section to where they would not be mixed in with the um, L2s, but they would have their separate lower level you know, so you could start developing and growing the program that way where you don't necessarily have to add staff, but you could add sections of that instead. Yeah, my situation is one of lower numbers. Right. Yeah. The other thing that we might consider is that the uh, receptive bilinguals, are, the heritage uh, student will have much more um, cultural information than the uh, L2, um, L2 students, so they can become experts in that particular area, specifically if, they're, if, if you guys are talking about um, Latinos in the U.S., uh, Spanish-speaking uh, communities in the U.S., they can become the experts. So maybe if you're thinking about a project, maybe think about a project where they can they can become the uh, the uh, the person, the go-to person that the other students can can talk to. Also, if the readings, uh, if you're bringing in readings to the HL2 class, maybe readings dealing with uh, with uh, uh, Latino issues in the U.S. so that uh, at least the readings will be, uh, they can relate to the readings somehow. Um, what is uh, the most effective way to teach accent marks? Because my the heritage speakers always say, I can't hear the difference, and I don't, I don't get it. And I, I, it really, it's a, it's a struggle every year, and anyway. Is there, is there, um, uh, yeah, and, I mean, yeah, so anyway, what's the most effective way, is there, I don't know, it's it's a really it's a big struggle with me every year. Uh, we, were talking, <laughs> we were talking with Jose Esteban earlier, and I promised to try to, uh, to organize a, a workshop because one of the chapters in our books deals with orthographic issues. And what I can tell you is that our evidence shows that learning the rules Metalinguistic knowledge about orthography doesn't work. Uh, that's the, the first finding. The second finding is that many, many of the issues that we see with our students are the same issues that teachers in Latin America and Spain are dealing with uh, everywhere, but exactly the same patterns of error, and we have data from Chile, from uh, Venezuela, from Colombia, Mexico, and Spain regarding accent mark, use of age, uh, Several, several different issues with S, C, and Z. I mean, all those issues are exactly the same. So it's not something that happened with our learners. It's just a problem of the orthographic system, actually. And everybody is trying to find ways. Um, <laughs> then, <laughs> so rules doesn't work much. Um, explanations based on phonotactic issues doesn't work that much, uh, in particular with words that have more than two syllables. Uh, learners cannot uh, really identify primary and secondary stress. Mm -hmm. And that's, there is some research on that. So trying to work with dictations or try to listen where it sounds, 
It really, no. It seems like the best way to go is by visual memory, meaning that learners have to encounter the world many, many times and work around that world. So when the other great finding, I think, in our study is that fixing, if we can use this word, 25 to 30 words of the overall output that solve 75% of the issues. So you need to focus only in a few set of words and just don't worry about the rest. Uh, particularly if you are working with them one or two semesters, just get a list. The, the first day you can do a, a writing activity, get, I mean, all the papers and say, okay, most of students, the problem is with accent in the last syllable, some diacritics, and maybe the use of H create a list of words, and the students have to actually work with those words all semester long. And the visual part is, is fundamental, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, frequency, frequency and is frequency, important. Yeah, that's the other. Okay. Someone asked the same question in that Facebook group, and a teacher said she had come up with some rhymes, and that it had made a tremendous difference. I think one of them was like, todo lo que rima con María, Lleva acento en la ia, and then like they did that over and over, and so they just and she worked on just a few of those and and like so, so recognize um, patterns and, and then patterns. mostly people said they have to read 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 and then they start to correct themselves. Uh, reading is great, but unless it's focus, it won't work. Okay. Uh, I mean, the students have to really notice awareness, attention and then representation. So there is a step. It's not just reading, reading, reading. Mm -hmm. Helps of everything, but you have to be really focused. So I'd like to share something about that. Um, some people say they only focus on the ones that word doesn't fix, the autocorrect. So that's one approach. Um, but I still like for students to be able to write a letter by hand and be able to use marks correctly. So in, in our program, we still do the rules because we haven't found a better way, you know. But one thing I, I've been doing in my advanced class for heritage learners is we keep a journal where the students write by hand every week. So they write about a topic we assign, just a page, and then we, I collect it back and I underline the spelling mistakes and I give it back. And so then they have to correct it and explain why. And we still use the rules, but they explain why. And then uh, they get the rest of the points for the assignment. So we do that once a week throughout the semester. And by the end, it's because they're using the same words every week because it's their own vocabulary, those are the words where they make the mistakes, right? So if they learn to correct those words, they don't want to do it 10 times during the semester. So by the end, they remember, oh yeah, mas tiene tilde. So that's if they have to work for it and remember to correct it every time, then it's repetition and it's their own words, the same common mistakes that they always make. So just focusing on repeating the same type of work. Bueno, y en mi caso tal vez creo que, bueno, para mí no son importantes los acentos, pero creo que para ellos sí son importantes. Cuando les pedimos en reflexiones que escriban este, cuáles son sus este, expectaciones del curso, entonces dicen, oh, yo quiero aprender los acentos. Entonces, lo veo en la clase y vemos las reglas, pero lo, lo veo muy rápido porque les digo que, que no es lo más importante, ¿no? lo más importante es que escriban. Este, y sí vemos los acentos como el, el acento diacrítico, por ejemplo, pero no, no nos pasamos no más de una clase hablando de los acentos, ¿no? Entonces, también decirles que, que no es lo, lo importante del, del curso, ¿no? no, no si sí es, sí lo vamos a ver, pero no, no va a ser este relevante, ¿no? El, lo que yo, bueno, yo vengo de una, por supuesto, lo que yo hago es multiliteracy, ¿no es cierto? Y, y vengo de, de toda esta idea que eh, una de las cosas que, que, bueno, que hay que tener en cuenta siempre es... es eh, cuando uno está viendo particularmente un tipo de discurso, tienen que ver toda la parte también que tiene que ver con la forma ¿no? del discurso. Entonces, una de las cosas que yo he hecho y que realmente me ha dado resultado en base a mi investigación es eh, siempre eh, tratar de unir todo lo que tenga que ver con arto, la ortografía con la, el uso de la gramática. Entonces, por ejemplo, cuando yo enseño el pretérito, la diferencia, hablamos de la diferencia entre el pretérito y el imperfecto, aprovecho con el pretérito a, a explicar las reglas 
reglas de, de este, las palabras agudas, ¿no es cierto? Y con el imperfecto utilizo eh, las palabras esdrújulas, ¿no? Y, pero está todo ligado a lo que ellos van haciendo, es decir, está, está todo ligado dentro de una unidad eh, de instrucción. Entonces, si hay una regla, tienen... La entienden, pero en base al uso, ¿no? En base a la gramática, pero la gramática siempre un, unida al uso. Y eso me ha funcionado a mí. Y también, por supuesto, pero muchas de las cosas que, 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 que dijeron mis colegas, ¿no? Que tiene que ver también con todo esto de... Pero siempre unido al significado, ¿no? Y, y sí, la idea de, de práctica, la idea de que ellos mismos este, reflexionen sobre por qué existe el error y cómo mejorar el error, ¿no es cierto? Pero no las reglas por... por no las reglas de memoria no sirven, ¿no? no. En mi, en mi eh, experiencia. Bueno, una de las actividades que yo les pongo es, uh, uh, después que les explico las reglas, hacemos algunos ejercicios y después hacemos un pequeño proyecto que se llama el tren de los acentos. Entonces, yo les dibujo, les doy hojas con, de un tren, ¿verdad? Y le digo, ahora les traigo revistas a periódicos que están en español y, o libros, tengo algunos libros de primaria de México, ahí se dan vuelo a recortar, buscar las palabras y por lo menos diez, ejemplos de 10 palabras. Eh, yo creo que eso es más, uh, eso les ayuda a visualizar la palabra y poder en, eh, en ponerla. Y esta, y esta sí, y esta es esdrújula, y, este es, ¿sí? y, y es lo único que vemos, ya pasamos, siguen teniendo errores, pero yo creo que lo más importante es que eh, después cuando se acostumbran a ir leyendo a veces y a ir viendo ah, la palabra, ah, esta sí tuvo acento, esta no, esta porque, porque sí, y, y eh, corregir después la escritura y, y los llevo al… Uh, ¿Dónde pondrías esta palabra en el tren? Ah, pues aquí, ¿verdad? Entonces es lo único. Pero yo quería hacer, aprovechar el micrófono para hacer otra pregunta. Sí. <ríe> este, a mí me interesa mucho um, eh, reforzar la identidad cultural. Entonces yo quisiera que me dieran algunos consejos de actividades, así que me digan… Oh, o sea, esto, o sea, ¿cómo puedo reforzarles la identidad cultural y el, el, el orgullo de, 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 de esta identidad? Es, en eso es, quiero enfocar mi, mi, mi curso, sobre todo. Bueno, ya, ya que tengo el micrófono. <risa> no, una de las cosas que hicimos este semestre que funcionó muy bien en nuestro programa fue un concurso de fotografía que en realidad no fue un, bueno, fue un concurso, una exhibición de fotografía, donde los estudiantes tuvieron que básicamente eh, sacar fotografías, salir del campus, ¿no? ¿no es cierto? Somos en la universidad, y documentar todo lo que es la presencia hispana en, eh, bueno, en College Station y en Bryan, ¿no? En, el, en, el, en Brazos County. Entonces, básicamente los estudiantes sacaron sus fotografías y después tuvieron que... Eh, eh, reflexionar sobre qué es lo que, qué aspecto de la comunidad hispana representaba esa fotografía, por qué habían sacado esa fotografía y por qué creían que tenía que ver con la comunidad hispana. Y lo que vimos, lo que ellos tenían que hacer era documentar la diversidad dentro de la comunidad hispana, a todo tipo de nivel. Y muchos de ellos también tuvieron que, incluso también tenían que entrevistar a una persona que ellos pensaran que era representativa de esa comunidad y que tuviera un, un tipo de, de este, lazo con ellos. ¿no? Entonces, algunos de ellos entrevistaron a sus abuelos, pero hay otra gente que entrevistó, a, a, por ejemplo, a la persona eh, que tenía un puesto de, de callejero, ¿no es cierto?, de frutas. Eh, y, y eso fue una cosa que después entonces lo que hicimos fue una exhibición en que invitamos a toda la universidad para que vieran las, las fotos de los estudiantes. Salió súper bien y los estudiantes se sintieron muy, muy bien. Y muchos de ellos dijeron que habían descubierto aspectos de su comunidad que no conocían. Entonces eso es algo que es una cosa multimodal porque los estudiantes tienen que hacer fotografías y tienen que expresar, eh, también tuvieron que hacer videos eh, eh, o sea, tuvieron que hacer tres, tres tipos de cosas diferentes. Una entrevista, las fotografías y la explicación de lo que era la fotografía en un video en español. Entonces, fueron tres tipos de, de, de... Es un proyecto multimodal, pero que tenía todo que ver con la diversidad de la identidad hispana en Brazos County. Eso es una de las cosas que nos salió súper bien. Y, y hasta le dimos un premio y todo a los estudiantes. Tuvimos tres premios. Sí. Entonces, eso fue una cosa que no funcionó. No sé, una idea. Sí. 
sea, un comentario. Ah. Bueno, primero. No. Ah, bueno, nada más este. Por ejemplo, la, la poesía, ¿no? Creo que aquí me mencionaban sobre los poemas también. Entonces, les puedes decir que, que escriban un poema sobre ellos, ¿no? Para, con este, para hablar de, lo, de cómo se identifican ellos. Entonces, creo que les va muy bien. Este, yo, por ejemplo, este, el semestre pasado lo pedí y hasta usaban inglés y español porque pues, es una forma en la que se identifican ellos, ¿no? Um, un proyecto que yo he hecho es el proyecto de familia y ese se tarda todo el año porque van a estar recopilando um, uh, historias de sus abuelos, de sus padres, de cómo se conocieron de los dos lados de la familia, si es que los tienen, y escriben una hoja acerca de cada, de cada lado de la familia. Entonces, van, esta es la historia de mis abuelos maternos paternos y van haciéndolo así, ahora de mi papá, de mi mamá, el encuentro cuando se conocieron y luego ya escriben una hoja acerca de sus hermanos y lo último es de ellos, de ellos mismos. Y en, esta, en este álbum que están este, haciendo, que se, se tarda un año para hacer todo esto, van a juntar también recetas de familia porque este, tienen ellos este, mucho orgullo de que mi mamá es el mejor pozole, mi este, papá cocina birria, este, recetas de familia, anécdotas familiares, um, alguna canción que cantan cuando se reúne la familia, la letra de la canción. Este, algunos alumnos hasta me han este, puesto uh, toallitas tejidas a mano por su abuelita. Entonces, cuando lo terminan, lo tienen que terminar como para abril, porque se lo van a ofrecer a su mamá para el Día de las Madres. Entonces, ellos son los historiadores para su familia y eso sí les da bastante orgullo porque quieren compartir con todos estas son las recetas, estas son las canciones, pueden poner dichos, pueden poner este, chistes que no sean colorados, este, eh, les digo PG-13 por favor, entonces este, algunas historias cuando yo me pongo a leer todo esto he llorado porque algunas historias son trágicas, algunas historias son muy tristes acerca de, de cómo llegaron a este país y este, pero eso les da mucho orgullo y va a haber errores, muchos errores, pero las historias son lo más importante, el contenido. Y les digo, háganlo muy bonito porque ese va a ser el regalo para su mamá para el Día de la Madre y entonces ese es el objetivo para que le echen ganas, para que lo hagan, para que lo hagan bien. Sí, no, me imagino que si no sabían sobre su familia, es un buen momento para, para este, investigar más, saber más de, de ellos, de sus uh -huh. orígenes, ¿no? Uh -huh. Y eso es, es exactamente, eso es exactamente un texto de identidad. Es lo que, con lo que yo trabajo, o sea, hago investigación, identity text, que es lo que, ha, que, lo, que, es lo que ha hecho Cummins en Canadá por muchos, muchos años y que funciona totalmente. Y que si en algún momento quisieras, podrías cambiarlo. Es decir, por supuesto, está la parte que ellos le regalan a su mamá, pero eso da muchísimo para hacerlo totalmente multimodal tener una, un digital storytelling y ahí tenés de todo, ahí puedes poner fotos, puedes poner entrevistas, puedes poner texto, claro, no, lo, no, no, es, el, no es tangible, ¿no? pero estaría allí, pero sí, eso es una, es una cosa espectacular, lo que sí podrías hacer también en algún momento para que otra gente lo viera es hacer un, un sitio de web y que cada estudiante presentara, eso sería también lindo. Tener un video que cada uno de sus, que los estudiantes, no solamente, o sea, tener eso, pero que cada uno de tus estudiantes hablara de cómo lo hizo, por qué lo hizo. Y tener unos videos que lo podrías poner en el sitio de tu escuela y ver. Y eso es otra cosa tangible. Y eso es una cosa también que ellos se pueden llevar después. Eh, puede ser un portfolio que ellos tengan, ¿no es cierto? Y no, es, es una idea espectacular. Que da para muchísimo, sí, sí, sí. Cada quien usa lo que quiere, uno claro. lo hacen así como algo. Este no es, esta es otra cosa que mis muchachos de Latinos Unidos me dieron de regalo para fin de año para que no los olvidara. Ah. Todas sus fotos, de dónde son, de sus papás, todo esto. Y luego al final, esos, se, todos se grabaron. Mis muchachos de, de mi club de Latinos Unidos me hicieron, me dieron las gracias por todo lo que los tres, cuatro años que habían estado conmigo lo que este, significó en sus vidas, todo esto. Entonces, pero así, usan algo así. Alguno 
niños hacen, unas niñas ponen encaje, le ponen, no, hacen cosas que, wow, es bastante. Pero no hay un rubric. La rubrica es una lista que yo les, que yo les hago. Este, vas a hablar de cada lado de tu familia. A veces no tienen un lado de la familia. A veces los papás no les quieren decir. Alguna vez alguna mamá me mandó a decir, ¿a usted qué le importa? Entonces a, a ese niño le tuve que dar otro proyecto. Porque me dijo, no, no puedo conseguir información, Marcia. De que tú vas a hacer otra cosa, pero a veces no se puede porque no quieren hablar. Depending, depending on the project, but uh, with identity, remember that uh, you can let the students know that uh, there's a personal identity, there's a cultural identity, group identity, uh, different ways of negotiating identity or how we're constantly negotiating identities. So that, that might be something that you could uh, incorporate into the project. So in cases like that, there's not only family identity, but there's also group identity or other types to identify ourselves. So. But the the the, um, the things that we shared today are good models for for dealing with identity. I mean, the things that some of you uh, discuss and share seem to me like good models somewhere where we can either start or that we can already adapt to our to our own uh, class classrooms. Have you all used Latino Latinx? Yeah. 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 Do you have like units developed with that? <laughs> <laughs> on the, the banda sonora, that's actually what we do first. And then and then start doing the banda sonora because it's a song yeah. where it talks about all the Latino and everything. I've done it in my regular classes, but, but surely and that would be <laughs> We listened to Latino America before the Banda Sonora project. <laughs> yeah, because they're recording. I know. De, de, de todos los países, ¿no? Entonces, es un poquito más reciente, pero sí, sí hay muchas canciones, ¿no? Que, que podemos usar en las clases. I have a question um, about uh, one of about actually the teachers or the instructors of heritage Spanish classes, and, um, and I'm really grateful to Flavia for bringing it up in your talk today. Um, but I wanted to ask the opinion of all of you, the presenters, of how would you define the ideal teacher of a heritage Spanish language classroom, and um, what would you prioritize? Right, because we don't have everything at our disposal necessarily. Um, specifically, I've, I've come across this attitude the last few years and, and um, been curious to get the opinions of other people of what's more important, training and expertise and how to teach these students or being from the same background as them. So is it the shared, you know, the shared identity or more just um, knowing what to do in the class? Yeah, so um, I find it interesting, and this is kind of a, a follow-up question to the same idea. Um, and I've, I've, I'd be interested to know everybody's opinion, actually. Um, I find it interesting that for heritage Spanish classes, the identity of the professor is so important, whereas for just traditional Spanish classes, it's a little bit less the focus, right? So you have non-native and you have native and heritage instructors for the traditional Spanish classes, but there's um, kind of a focus on having heritage um, speakers to teach heritage students. So I'm kind of would like to discuss that or hear what you guys have to say. I can think on, so we have to think on, on our context to, to, to decide uh, what to do with our students, what, what we want to, to focus on the, on the classes. So it's just hard to, to say that, oh, we should follow this, this model. I don't know, so. I think that the most important aspect is training, methodology. I mean, you need to be trained to teach heritage language learners or L2 learners. I mean, that's, to me, it's, it's non-negotiable. I mean, you need to have training. Um, when it comes to, you know, who teaches those classes, um, I don't think it is, well, you know, I've, I've encountered this, this particular prejudice because I am from Argentina. Um, 
people in my department think that I cannot teach the heritage language learner classes, even though I have years and years of experience training teachers, doing research with heritage language learners, you know. But there is that, that's, um, to me, it's really stupid, you know, and it's prejudice. I mean, to me, it doesn't really matter who, where you are from. What, it, what matters uh, is, if, do you have the training? That's the, the important thing. And I'm sure that Flavia is going to agree with me. <laughs> I think the training is fundamental. Yeah. And, and, and we're doing a horrible job preparing future teachers of heritage learners. That's the truth. If you see the standards, the new portfolios, the, the, the new teachers are required to prepare, uh, the LOTE, the Spanish LOTE exam here in Texas, I don't know in other states, uh, those are horrible exams and the preparation for them don't take into account all the information that we gather today. Uh, so I think that the, the you know discipline. What you do in the classroom. Exactly. I mean, what really happens in the classroom. And the methods. Yeah. No for instance. <laughs> no, yes. mm -hmm. Or we're implementing a book, a textbook, but it's going to be in four years from now. Exactly. And here you go, here's this class. And, and you have 70% uh, of Hispanic students sitting there. Yeah, I mean, and I think that this is a huge area of, 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 I mean, of, of lacking that we have. And everybody has to push for it. And I think that everybody should push your own institution, schools, university, colleges, to bring more assets to the table and to request funding. And I know that it's a big fight, but we have to do it. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a comment. <clears throat> I agree with you completely about the training, but I also feel like, and I teach at a community college, so I realize that some people teach in high school, some at four universities, some in language departments, maybe not in teaching both sections. But for me, I understand the argument about, I understand from the other side, being a Chicana and being a heritage speaker, I understand that. But I think that it's, I think you could describe it in a different way and then it would be easier to understand that argument. And for me, and I do this in all my classes, no matter what class I teach, whether I'm teaching a film class, even a class in English, I have students who already come unprepared, already have many challenges in their lives, already don't visualize themselves as real students they have a lot of issues. A lot of heritage speakers already fall into that category whether they're going to university or not. So I identify with those struggles that they have. And the thing that I do in my class that I think is the most important thing that I think should be part of teacher training, which often isn't, is that I, from the very beginning, tell my students a story about who I am and tell them things about my life and tell them how I got to where I was, whether they think I'm successful or not. And I, may, I continue to open pathways for them to identify with me, to make a connection with me as a human being. And I think that a lot of teachers, for whatever reason, because we have to draw lines between students and that, find it very difficult to, to connect with students or put themselves out there on a limb so that their students can see them as real people that they can identify with. Now, can we identify on the same level with all our students all the time? No, but I tell a story about my very sinuous path to university, that I wasn't a traditional student, I was an awful high school student, I didn't grow up speaking Spanish, et cetera. And I, every semester, I have at least five or six students who come up to me in the first week and say, thank you for telling me that story. Thank you for telling me that I could be something different, even if I don't want to be what you are. And I think that that's the big mistake. And I think that the argument about who teaches the class comes from that space, but it's articulated in a way that seems offensive. You know, because I don't think that just because I'm Chicana, I can't teach English literature. It's the same argument. But I do understand the desire to make a comfortable and safe, safe place for heritage speakers who already are coming into a potentially humiliating situation uh, because of what they bring with them around language and how personal it is. So just to kind of give a really honest answer to your question, because I also think that people want to, not you necessarily, it's a difficult question to approach because people are nervous about saying the wrong thing. I think that that's where the 
I think that that's where the push comes from because I identify with that. But I think that if, if you're not a Latino and you're not a native Spanish speaker or a heritage speaker, there's a way still to connect to your students and respect where they come from and share something about yourself that allows them to feel like they can be vulnerable and connect with you and safe. And I think that is most important. And if you, if you can create that kind of environment with them, then it doesn't matter what your race or your ethnicity is, but that's hard for people to do, I think. And I think that when you, if I have a class of heritage speakers and they all look like me and they all have similar experiences, then it's kind of a no brainer. We already assume, oh, yo puedo conectar con ella porque ya si me conoce, me, me entiende, no? But it, it's, that requires people who aren't, who don't look like them, who don't sound like them, to take those extra steps as part, I think, of training to make that effort. And that's true for all students, not just Chicano students or you know, heritage speakers, is for whatever class you teach. And I think that sometimes, I mean, at least in my institution, where you know, most of the instructors are white in all the disciplines, um, I, don't see, I don't see professors doing that enough because they, they don't want to open themselves up to that. But um, I just wanted to answer your question honestly as, as you asked it. <laughs> So um, following up on that, my question would be, like, as a very, very white woman <laughs> um, who teaches, I'm the, only, I'm the only foreign language teacher in my school. They have no other options. Uh, they are stuck with a white woman as a Spanish teacher. Um, and yeah, but um, no, I'm not saying there's something wrong with that. But what is something that I can do to make sure that I'm being understanding of them? Um, I guess I have students who walk into my class and are like, do you even speak Spanish? And they look at me like, why are you here? But how do like how do I make that connection as how, like because there is there is a there there is almost a fence or a something that a wall. <laughs> I didn't want to say that wall. <laughs> I didn't want to say the wall <laughs> word. She said the wall word. <laughs> I was trying to stay away from that. Uh -huh. But there is a barrier that is, there's a barrier that's there instinctively between me and my students before I say a word. What is, uh, what's the best way or what's an idea of how to overcome that barrier in a sympathetic way so that they understand that I'm on their side? You tell your students exactly how you feel when you're in a room full of 50 Spanish native speakers and it's your turn to talk. When, tell them about how vulnerable you feel, how scary it is, how you have to stand your ground even though it seems frightening when everybody's looking at you waiting for you to make a mistake. Tell them about that. Tell them what it feels like for real, even if it feels personal. That would be my advice. Share that with them. It is scary. I know it's scary. Because that's what it's like for even me as a heritage speaker. When I, when I started studying Spanish, and people would look at me and assume one thing. You know, I decided to learn Spanish because I got tired of people saying, what kind of Mexican are you? The kind that doesn't speak Spanish. <laughs> Tell them about that. I think that is fundamental. Remember the, the chart, or well, you can you can check it out. But first, you have to know your your population. You have to know the struggles, the particular struggle and the issues in the community where they're coming from, and then you can use your training as a language learner to say, okay, it was very difficult for me to understand the past tenses, or it was very difficult, and, and the struggles that you have with remembering vocabulary and, and finding this point of contact, because at the end, I mean, you are learning with them. I'm from Argentina, and I had to, my, my vocabulary increased in the past 10 years, I don't know how much, but because I have to train myself and learn new words, and oh, okay, this is from Nicaragua, I didn't know this word. And, and, and see it also like a interesting discovery that we're discovering together issues that have to do with language, with identity, with culture, and try to, to put yourself in, okay, we're together in this trip. Um, There's an article that I haven't read, but someone recommended once, and the title stuck in my head because, so, have you, you know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about. And they I haven't read it, did you read it? I couldn't find it, 
It's called A Gringa is Teaching Me Spanish. I can't find it anywhere. I could not find it. No. Can you find that article? I don't have it. I don't know. I just wanted to follow up on what she was saying back there. I, I, I didn't grow up speaking Spanish myself. And so, um, you know, that's the first question. Well, where are you from? I go, San Marcos. And they go, where are your parents from? I go, San Marcos. Where are your grandparents from? San Marcos. And they're like, oh, pues, tú no eres mexicano. Y tal. And, and so, but I, but I tell them up front, and, and it helped. I tell them, if I say something wrong or incorrectly, correct me. It's okay. That's how we're going to learn together. And I tell them that, I, that I'm a student of the language and I'll always be a student of the language. And, and, but they're also going to learn things that they, they also didn't know um, as, as heritage speakers, you know, the accent marks and all that stuff. And so we kind of work together and it helps. Um, but it did. I, I, when I got to the school five years ago, it was a group of kids that nobody wanted to teach, to be honest. They had a, a lady in there and um, uh, she was Argentinian. And so they didn't, you know, bond, they didn't connect her in, in that regard. And then she was a woman. There was a lot of a lot of male students in there from Mexico, and they had a problem with respect and the whole thing. And so they literally, when I interviewed, they said, "Do you mind teaching this class?" I said, Absolutely, no problem. I don't mind at all. And so it was a group of kids that nobody wanted. And so as such, there wasn't, you know, a curriculum, books. There wasn't anything. They just said, "Here you go." And I went, "Okay." So like you said, I didn't I didn't have a lot of training. I've kind of been learning on the fly as I've been going up through this for five years. And so it's been a, a really big learning experience. And I'm glad I came to this. So it's, I've got a lot of really good ideas and stuff. So anyway. Do people have training first? <laughs> I don't mean that like. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know it existed. I mean, it, it was a. Uh... She says it could be universal. It's, 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 I mean, I, I mean, it's true. I mean, it's one of the big failing of the profession at this point, and we need to start working on this. Um, yeah. It's not part of the thing. It was just, you know, take care of the yeah. Also, I want to give you thank you. Thanks. Uh, porque cuando yo vine hace 11 años, yo soy de México. Eh, me eduqué allá, mi profesión y todo, y vine aquí. Según yo, hablaba inglés, pero nada, ¿verdad? Este, cuando llegué aquí, ¿no? Entonces, llegué a estudiar inglés eh, y luego entré a un ACP program. Y mi meta era convertirme en maestra bilingüe. Tenía, eh, lo que más me motivaba es, eh, había oído lo que batallaban los niños que recién llegaban y que no tenían el soporte en su idioma para, para desarrollarlo, porque los papás no sabían el inglés, quién se comunicaba. Entonces, yo quería eh, estar, eh, ayudar en esa área y trabajar en esa área. Por alguna razón, cuando estaba haciendo el ACP, me dijeron, te recomiendo que hagas el, la certificación en español. Pues, porque para que te puedas emplear mejor, ¿verdad? Si no es en una, pues en otra. Ah, pues sí, lo hice en español, pasé muy bien el examen y todo. Y empecé a buscar trabajo como maestra bilingüe. Eh, pero encontré trabajo primero como maestra de, de español en, en high school. Y, y al siguiente día casi creo que me ofrecieron una posición para segundo de bilingüe, pero ya había firmado el contrato. Entonces dije, bueno, voy a quedar aquí. Eh, fue un impacto muy fuerte para mí venir a trabajar en el ambiente aquí en, en Estados Unidos. Para empezar, yo tenía ya mucho de no estar en escuela, ¿verdad? Más que lo que mis hijos iban, pero yo no, no estaba parte de una escuela. Y, y era muy diferente. Yo esperaba encontrar un ambiente completamente diferente. Me maltrataron mucho los alumnos. Me fue muy mal con, con la, la disciplina. El primer año, este, los muchachos de, se burlaban, los africanoamericanos se burlaban de mi inglés. Entonces, tenía, no tenía ninguna clase de hispanohablantes. Y cuando me dieron la clase de hispanohablantes, ¡oh, qué emoción! Sí, a los dos años fue completamente diferente. Fue porque me identifiqué con ellos. Y ellos me respetaban, ¿sí? Y yo estaba emocionada de poder enseñarles y hacerlos crecer porque sentí que ellos también valoraban ¿sí? lo que yo les estaba dando. Pero me enfoqué mucho a gramática, gramática, gramática. Entonces, eh, siento que llegué a hacer mis clases un poco pesadas, ¿sí? Y cuando yo empecé a venir a estos entrenamientos, no sé qué, tres años, el primero, el año pasado no vine, pero el anterior sí, este, 
eh, me llevé una visión totalmente diferente de lo que era el alumno hispanohablante. ¿sí? Eh, y ha, me ha servido mucho, mucho para cambiar mi forma de enseñar y mi forma de conectarme. Ahora no nada más con el hispanohablante, sino también con el afroamericano. O sea, eh, lo que ella decía, ¿sí? o sea, yo les digo a mis, a mis alumnos, ok, yo te enseño el español y tú me enseñas el inglés. Tú corrige mi inglés lo que quieras y yo aprende de mí el español, que es lo que yo te puedo dar lo mejor de mí, que es mi, mi español, que es bueno. Tú dame lo mejor de ti, que es tu inglés. ¿Sí? Así que así he, he manejado me, mucho mejor mis clases. Y gracias por, por estos entrenamientos. Qué buena manera de concluir. Sí. <risa> ¿Hay alguna otra pregunta? porque ya son las cuatro y no los quiero tener aquí más de lo que les habíamos dicho. Eh, si no con eso, por favor, ayúdenme a agradecer otra vez a los presentadores. <risa>